my hope is that this book will be read by young people and they ask themselves that is there anything here that I can use for my own future? I think it's so important is because these days brain science is steered a little bit towards methods. So when I go around and have discussions with the postdocs and students and I ask them what they are doing, it is striking how few of them formulate what the problem is they want to solve. Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast where we explore how recent discoveries in neuroscience are unraveling the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 172. Before I tell you about today's guest, I want to remind you that you can find additional episodes of Brain Science, along with complete show notes and episode transcripts, at my website at brainsciencepodcast.com. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or submit voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash docartemis. You can also post comments on the Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. Today, I'd like to also encourage you to please try out the free trial of The Great Courses Plus at thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash G-I-N-G-E-R. My guest today is Dr. Yuri Busaki. Dr. Busaki is widely considered a pioneer in the study of brain rhythms, and he appeared on this podcast way back in episode 31 when we talked about his highly respected book, Brain Rhythms. That was way back in 2008, so I'm honored to have him back to talk about his fascinating new book, The Brain from the Inside Out. I'll be back after the interview to share a few brief announcements, including an update on my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. This is a fairly long interview, but I should also mention that the ad-free version contains an extra five minutes. So if you're a $10 a month Patreon supporter, be sure to check your email for a link to the longer version. It is fantastic to have you back on Brain Science, Yuri. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's been, let's see, 2008 since we last talked. It's not so long ago. (laughs) No, I guess you're right, relative to the length of your career. But relative to the length of this show, that makes you one of the earliest guests. Well, on a linear scale, yes. But uh, if you remember (laughs) the last chapter of my book, on a log scale, (laughs) it's not a big difference. (laughs) Right. And we're going to talk a lot about the importance of the log scale as we get into the interview. And it's it's really interesting because I just got done talking with Andreas Nieder about numerosity in the brain. And of course, the Weber-Fechner law is really important there too. So that's going to be a really interesting thing to, to explore. But before we do, Yuri, would you just tell us a little bit about your own personal journey to becoming a neuroscientist? I was grown up in Hungary. I went to school. When I graduated from high school, I had to choose between what I really liked and what my parents allowed me to do. And I used to be a radio ham. I was very much interested in radio communication and the problem of coding and how you can send signals to faraway lands. I thought my career will be very clear. I wanted to be the first person in the world to shoot a a signal to the moon which bounces back and you can uh, receive it somewhere else. That was a nice dream, but my parents told me that I have to go to law school or medical school because uh, the engineering school was only in Budapest and uh, the expenses uh, kept me back in page. So I went to medical school. I felt lonely, but one day I stumbled into a laboratory. I met a professor who had an extraordinary influence on me, and that was the Department of Physiology. And from then on, my future was very clear. You know, that makes a lot of sense when I think about the kind of work you do now, because to me, it seems very engineering. 
like. I mean, the, the kind of stuff that you do. I started out as an engineer, although I didn't really have the strongest aptitude. So I sort of recognize that your engineering mind is at work there. So you feel, do you feel like you have been able to satisfy that engineering oh, part absolutely. of you? So when I, I said I was bored in medical school, that's not quite right, because I was bored at some of the lectures. But when I was in the lab, I was in heaven because uh, there were oscilloscopes and that was the area of computers and things like that. I realized that many of the things that I learned about communication and how to do control and uh, feedback and feed forward networks and resonators and oscillators and all these things were already in my head. So when I entered the field of neuroscience, then I had some preconceived and strongly biased uh, way how we approached it. I think it's fair to say for my listeners that might be relatively new to the show that that you are really one of the pioneers of exploring brain rhythms. That's how we, you got on the show a long time ago. Yes, uh, that's still one of my favorite things in the brain. And uh, we can talk about it a little bit later that uh, without some level of, uh, of structure, there is no way you can send information from one place to another. And that applies to every system, including the brain. And the brain is just happens to exploit something that physics already invented. We're going to be talking about your new book, which is The Brain from the Inside Out, which I think is more of a, to me, seems like more of a big picture of um, the question of how we should try to understand the brain and the big thing I got from it is that you're arguing that we need to take a different approach than we've done for many, many years. So who's the intended audience for this book? What I tried here is pretty much the same as I tried in my written books, that to write a uh, book that has a message to both the experts as well as the lay people. So I have written basically two books. I have the main narrative and there are lots of footnotes. If you are interested in the details of those things, you can jump to the footnotes. Otherwise, you just uh, neglect them. So if you neglect the footnotes, then, of course, the narrative is dedicated to whom? Uh, I would say cognitive scientists, psychologists, AI people, neurologists, psychiatrists, everything about around the brain. And people who are lay people but uh, have a college degree and interested in the brain, I think at least some of the chapters, chapter one, three, five, nine, 11, 13, are pretty easy to understand, I would say. I, uh, I leave the judgment for others. And if you skip those uh, little bit hard to read chapters, then uh, I think the audience is meant to be broad. Can you just start out by just giving us a brief overview of the brain from the inside out? Well, the overview is uh, basically my frustration. And it's not only mine. I think it's uh, very clear that you will see this kind of uh, shift everywhere in neuroscience in the coming years. And uh, it has a long precedent. But what you ask every now and then in science is that why is progress slowed down? I ask myself and my students and my colleagues also that, you know, let's see if we continue the paradigm that we inherited from uh, our giants. Let's say we just like to understand the vision. And we use the same framework that uh, has been in place for about more than uh, 50, 60 years now. How many more animals, how many more investigators, and how many more experiments are needed to get the answer? The answer was to me that infinite. <laughs> <laughs> then you ask, who told you that this is the right framework? So I started to go back in time and try to make my detective uh, uh, homework and see where do these ideas come from? Where are the constraints that allow us to think the way we think? And in the process, I also ventured into thinking of different cultures. And I realized that European chauvinism is not exactly the right attitude. People have done fantastic things in other parts of the world without adopting the framework of European thinking. I don't know about the United States very much, but when I was raised up in high school and uh, especially elementary school, then we talked about the European uh, superiority, especially that you know everything was created by the Greeks. There's a cradle of civilization. That's not quite true, <laughs> as, we, <laughs> as we realize now. So this was the broader picture. So I was looking specifically, you know, what can we do in brain sciences? 
and uh, I was in a relatively easy position, I would say, because from early on, I started to work in the middle of the brain, which is the hippocampus, and try to make sense what's coming out of that. And the funny thing that even if you're outsider, you just heard about the recent uh, Nobel Prizes and things like that. The interesting thing was there was a big crossover or turn, you know, how much we understand about sensation and how much we understand about the middle of the brain, such as the hippocampus. I think everybody sort of acknowledges in, in our field that there was a lot faster progress in the hippocampus than elsewhere. The reason for that is that we didn't use preconceived ideas to understand physiology, but we did sort of another way. And we wanted to see how we can interpret what we observed deep in the brain rather than at the surface. Would you expand on what you mean by that? In the book, you contrast the approach you're proposing that is the brain from the inside out with what you call the outside-in approach, which would be the one that's been the uh, standard approach. Why is that approach so limiting? Well, here is the, the bottom line. We inherited a framework without caring about the brain. So humanities didn't start it out with the brain. There is not a, no mention about the brain in the Bible or the Torah or anywhere. It's all about something else we call the mind. And then uh, many philosophers and uh, many religions wondered about our existence and uh, how the mind works and who is ruling the mind and what is the goal of the mind. And the answer is that the only reason why we have a mind and we had, because it was given to us to understand the truth. And the truth is outside in the veracity of the world, but the ultimate truth, of course, is God. So we got the mind from God and only we, and uh, it was given to us as a vehicle to understand the ultimate truth. And of course, it, you know, it was debated and there were many smart thinkers in the way, but the framework pretty much remained that we have a machine what is there to absorb something that comes from outside. And this framework was uh, very beautifully incorporated from Christian philosophers to the British empiricist thinking, and it was declared that everything we know is through our perceptions. That at the same time somehow was because they were so smart, you know, Hume and Hobbes and all these extraordinary good thinkers, they thought, aha, uh -huh, we can expand this thinking to the generality. And they basically codified how science should be made. And they came up with a couple of rules and, and so on. Now, fast forward a, a century or two, and then psychology came around. They already had the framework, said, oh, what do we do? And most of the things that we do is uh, dealing with how we learn about the very city of the world. And there is no other communication with the world except our sensors. So that was, I would say, the origin of all this psychological thinking. And I was looking for some landmarks and I found with somewhat arbitrariness that it was uh, the publication of a famous book. It's a two volume, 1500 pages long codex by William James. And then uh, he went through everything that back then humanity, at least the Western world knew about. Each of these chapters, the words and the phrases and the terms that we are using today. That was a good start for me saying, aha, uh -huh, these words are there. And uh, if I present these words, and which I did in many, many of my talks, and I ask, people in the audience, you know, do you identify with any of these terms? And they say yes. And I said, are there any people in the room who are working on something else than this? And then the answer is, you know, one or two or three people say, oh, I don't find myself on the list. Everybody finds himself or herself on the list and say, I'm going to devote my entire life to understand emotions or motivation or perception or memory and so on. So we put ourselves into the boxes. Then with this book, you know, psychology moved forward and then neuroscience came about. That is the brain science. Then we started to work in the brain. So what do we do? What we do is exactly to take the recipe and say, oh, the brain is there to understand the diversity of the environment. Therefore, we have to see how neurons behave when we present them something. So the preparations were very clear. Either it was anesthesia or had were fixed and then the eyes were fixed and we showed stimuli and we found responses. And this went on. In my book, I go through 
several other developments in, in neuroscience from Gestalt psychology to Pavlovian things. They all view the brain as a passive device. Of course, everybody knows that we don't only perceive, but also act somehow. How do you go from sensation to action, which is uh, typically called a perception action cycle, because there is something in the middle. And this is the middle, which caused me a lot of headache and everybody else, of course, because then you started to call the middle something. Back in the medieval times, it was the will, and then it was consciousness, and it was uh, other kinds of things. And if you want to be more neutral, you call it a central processor, or you can call it a black box, whatever you, you call it, that's always in the middle. And these are the things that are separating the inputs and the outputs. That's already a, a big obstacle because uh, then it means that there is some magic. You know, this is the Descartes' little man or homunculus that makes the decision for us. And, and it was very difficult to get rid of it. The second impetus was uh, going back in my radio ham world is they said, what is communication? And what is the role of coding? And how do you know that you are coding something? That, of course, is a bigger chapter. But it basically comes down to a very simple thing that the coding is a agreement between the sender and the receiver. Then you can ask, who is the receiver? Then this outside-in framework does one thing, that you present something out there, you are in the brain, and you are recording something, such as the ball signal in the fMRI, or unit firing if you are an electrophysiologist, or an EEG wave if you are a clinician. And you are in a privileged situation because you can see two things. One is you see the external world, that is the signals that you are giving, as well as you are recording the signal that you also see. You have two signals and you can compare them. But you are the decoder, you are the decoder, you are the mechanism that decodes it, and this privileged situation allows you to do that. And this is exactly what happened all over. We triumphantly declare that we are closer to understanding the brain code because we not only find a correlation, but in fact, we can reconstruct the signal from the outside signals that we are recording from the brain. We can come back and we should come back to this, to this problem. But the bottom line is that the neurons in the brain don't have this luxury. They don't see the world. Neurons in visual cortex don't know anything about vision. So how do you do this comparison without having two things. And the answer was that the only other information the brain can have is from our actions. So action is the most important thing. And there is another you know, chapter where it is trying to understand the, the basis of it, that the goal of the brain from this perspective, if you look at it more carefully, has nothing to do with the truth of the world or what's the how the world looks like. The important thing for the brain is to control the body and serve it and see how it helps its survival. So the fundamental thing it has to do, but again, I don't have to do, but this is what it seems to do, is generate spontaneous activity. It generates outputs. And the goal of these outputs is to predict the consequences of those outputs. That is, the brain's most important thing is to predict the future or to predict the consequences of its own actions. To know that I am the agent of my actions and this is what has to be registered. Now, if you look at it this way, it said, okay, now we have outputs, consequences. Now we can move the sensors. So I look at you from side and front, and then I have got two views, but it's possible only with action. And this is the source of the knowledge, I claim, in the book. The only source of the brain is this verification process, this calibration process that is needed for neurons in uh, the sensory areas to know something about the source of this change that they experience. Now, chapter three, or the other ingredients of this is that, aha, uh -huh, is there any interesting difference between going from one direction to the other? And the answer is yes, because every single time the brain generates an output, which is you move your muscles, you move your eyes, or you change your pupil size, or even if you change your stress hormone levels, that's also an output. That information is always signaled back to the sensory system or very large part of the brain. So that discovery has been done a long, long, long time ago. It hasn't been 
generalized to this level that I have done in my book, that this is the most important thing the, the brain has invented compared to the spinal cord, that the output is always sending an information back to the so-called sensory areas. Now, the sensory areas or the processing areas or whatever the name you choose have two inputs now. One is about what you have done or you are planning to do, as well as what's coming from the outside world. And this is, has a different name called reafference by the Germans, corollary discharge by an American neuroscientist. So there is a substrate. So what I did is I looked at the philosophy, looked at the framework, you know, where does it come from? And I said, what is the alternative? And this alternative for me was not necessarily the best, but something that is feasible and something that has a anatomical physiological substrate, namely that let's start with the output and make our way backwards. And this is what I call the inside out approach. So the most important thing in the inside out approach, just with one more uh, sentence is that it's not enough that the experimenter can make a correlation between two events outside and inside. But the important thing from the inside out approach is that you have to show that that pattern that you call or think is, is important is actually used by the brain. Those downstream neurons that are generating the change. Your time is valuable. That's why I think you will find Text Expander just as useful as I do. You save time by creating snippets so you don't have to type the same stuff over and over. Instead, use simple abbreviations that can expand into anything from a single word to a whole document. Best of all, it works on all your computers and is available for Mac OS, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad. Text Expander also hosts free webinars for beginners, advanced, and team users. To get 20% off your first year, just visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast. That's textexpander.com forward slash podcast. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about Text Expander on Brain Science. You wrote that you were talking about how, in the book, you talk about how consistently through history we've used this outside-in brain as a passive receiver of information about the world sort of approach. And you commented that behaviorism was a interruption of this approach. And I found that really intriguing. I also didn't quite get why you saw that as an exception to the overall trend. Well, the attitude was different. So behaviorism didn't start out with the Pavlovian dog that is in a harness. And the only goal of the brain is to associate the CS and the US. This is the associationalism. This is basically what we are talking about, that the brain is a passive device. This was a fantastic tool for the Soviet ideology for various obvious reasons, but behavior was not part of it. Nobody really recorded anything you know, what happens except Pablo had a student called Bikov who looked at the autonomic nervous system and so on. But the fundamental approach remained the same. Now came along the behaviorist and, you know, Thorndike and Skinner and all these people who I would say subconsciously, they had no idea what I'm talking about, the inside out approach. They just said, oh, I can generate a behavior and uh, I can shape that behavior with a reinforcer. And the reason why I, I mentioned that is that, of course, they treated the brain as a black box and this is all bad, bad, bad. But nevertheless, they put something in focus that later on became pretty interesting because there is another movement that I mentioned over and over in the book is a subconscious recognition of uh, certain areas of neuroscience, which I call, well, everybody calls them the brain machine interface, is that they used exactly the same approach. They said, okay, there is a goal here, an explicit goal. That is the goal from the point of view of an actuator. This is what I, I was talking about, the muscles and, and so on, the action system. And I have to move that cursor or that robot, what should I do? And so in this approach, it, and this is has certain analogies, of course, with the Skinnerian uh, behaviorism, that we wanted to know what is needed to shape that behavior. It starts with the action and it's trying to modify action. And I think the problem, of course, with Skinner is not necessarily the philosophy, but the attitude. He said, we don't have to do 
anything about the brain. But th that ignorance is echoed today in what everybody calls the connectionism, which is the AI system. Every AI has pretty much the same thing. On the one hand, is a blank slate. It's an empty space or tabula rasa. It starts out with nothing, and then we populate it. And it has an output. It generates an output, and all we have to do is to shape the output. So there are two things here that are critical, both in AI and, and skin areaism. One is that everything is possible. Everything can be be shaped, but the same thing is, is true with the outside in. We can associate everything we want because the brain is so super flexible. All we have to do is feed back the information from the periphery. And the second thing is that in all of the approaches, even though it's not declared, but tacitly accepted, that we start out with a blank slate. We start out with something, nothing. And you argue very strongly in the book that that is just not the way the brain really works. What about the work of Rodolfo Linnaeus? Am I pronouncing his name right? Rodolfo Linnaeus, yes. A very good friend of mine, my good colleague at NYU. Gosh, I, I, I would love to interview him because he's like one of the pioneers, right? Yes, yes. I would be very happy to link you up with him. Was his thinking and his work an inspiration for you in this endeavor? Well, he is an inspiration, but our thought and thinking converged rather than uh, one influenced the other, I would say. He started with the thalamocortical system and different ways. And the reason why we became friends, I think, is because of our similar thinking. I tried to find my sources, and I would say that perhaps the best influence indirectly was uh, my mentor in Hungary, and then especially my postdoctoral mentor, Case van der Wolf. Case van der Wolf was my postdoctoral advisor, and he was very much buying into the European ethology approach that you have to look at behavior very, very carefully and see how behavior expresses things. So I'm looking at you, you know, the reason why I wanted to see your face, because you just cannot think without blinking, without moving, and so on. So there is such a thing as what we call primacy of movement. And this is what Rodolfo observed, and his uh, wonderful book, The Eye of the Vortex, is uh, underlying this. And of course, we have predecessors. I can go back to you know, at least a century <laughs> earlier and find people who are thinking about the same line. So I think both of our thinking can be put into a bracket of, say, embodied thinking. The funny truth is that Rodolfo didn't know much about embodied thinking. I didn't know about anybody <laughs> thinking either. <laughs> and uh, when I read those books and when we discuss it, we have bi-weekly lunches with him. Then we are just trying to see well, where do these ideas come from? And the answer is probably because we are reading the same literature. Ideas are popping up multiple areas. The difference between all the others and maybe Rodolfo and myself is that we actually care about the brain. So we were looking for brain mechanisms, not only how the mind is affected by uh, being placed in the body. Could you take us through the key features of this inside-out approach? Well, let's start with the, the first axiom, if you want. <laughs> the, the brain is a self-organized system. It has a, uh, a dynamic that is generated independent of the environment. So this is a big claim very difficult to directly test to say, my brain wouldn't be fundamentally different if I never experienced anything. If I have my brain 20 years in a, in a or 30 years or more in a, in a dish, and we supply it with all the in ingredients and so on, and then we look at the EEG activity, we look at firing of the neurons and so on, and we look at the basic rules. My suggestion is that it pretty much will be the same. So if that is the case, then it has enormous constraints because it doesn't have a, the connectivity of, and the ability to do anything. It has limitations, and uh, these limitations are very good, and we can discuss why they are very good. And the reason why it is doing this is because the self-organized system is interested in what is to be done in the embeddedness, namely in, in the body and what it can do and serve, and then later on, maybe how one brain can affect the other. So that's the, the number one. Number two is that I say, mm, in order to understand perception, we have to start out with action. And this is where I think the similarity that you pointed out with Rodolfo comes with. He agrees the primacy of movement also. We both had the same uh, 
the analogy is that the first creatures in the world probably could survive without perception. All you have to do is move a little bit and if you're in the right environment, such as the seawater, then there is some chance that you will survive because you will find food. With COVID-19, this is exactly the situation. If you find <laughs> bodies, you can multiply. If you don't find bodies, you are dead, even if you don't have sensors, right? So the sensors should come only when you have the ability to utilize that information. So you, I go back again to the Christian philosophies and British empiricism asking, what is the use of perceiving without acting upon the perceived item? Zero. There is no utility for the brain to know everything about the world and doing nothing about it. But on the other way around, it is a very, very, very useful to have a sensor that I can move and utilize the capacity of the sensor, but it can be done only if I have a control on it. The third ingredient, uh, which is equally useful, I think, is that I always ask the question, and this is the attitude of my laboratory, that is never sufficient to make a correlation between the outside and inside. But you have to show, in addition, that those activities in the brain that you call a code are useful also for the readers, the downstream readers, downstream observers, that is other neurons. Unless the pattern or the relationship that the experimenter discovers is utilized by the brain, and then you can show it, that is not an information. So let, let me give you an example. I can find a beautiful relationship between scalp recording of the EEG or an fMRI signal and something that we show. For example, I can play music to your brain and if I have the high enough resolution of so-called local field potential, so EEG, I can make a decoder and decode the music in such a way that I can reconstruct it. What it means is that I can play back a song that you just heard from nothing else but the brain signals. And this is a great, great, great thing, right? Because it's very useful for a variety of different applications. But I learned absolutely nothing about how the brain causes because the brain does not use EEG. And it's said, useful? Yes, it's useful. To whom? To the experiment. Is it useful to the brain? No. The analogy would be the cardiologist who is listening to your heart murmur. And you said, oh, you've got a, uh, a problem because I can hear it. That's fantastic. It's very good for the cardiologist, but the heart never uses the sound. <laughs> the heart is not used. It's a product. Now, when we do the same game with units, and we know that with action potentials, that is, we're recording from uh, single neurons or, or multiple group of neurons, then because we know that those action potentials go somewhere else, then we tend to believe that actually a correlation is doing something to the rest of the brain, that's maybe true, but it, it, we had no proof that it actually utilized the way how we think it is utilized. So the third ingredient is that I have a downstream viewer or observer-centric view. You can say, oh, it's the same attitude happened in physics just 100 years ago. The role of the observer and uh, the uncertainties that everything comes with it, it's not a specific for problem for neuroscience, but it's a general problem for science. In reading, I got the definite idea that the idea that the brain is not a blank slate is an important piece of this approach, right? Yeah, that's the first one. Right. So would you expand on that aspect and why that's important? So uh, you asked me this general question. I said, gave you three ingredients or three things to look at. And now you ask the relevant question. And the relevant question, of course, is that how different the outside in versus the inside out in terms of uh, how we think the outside world or we know anything about the world. And the answer is that in the outside in approach, you think that you are shoveling in information into the brain. That is, you fill up the brain with knowledge. If it starts from nothing, then you have to give a little knowledge and then more knowledge and more knowledge. In other words, in that framework, the complexity of the brain should scale with your experience. And that's a dangerous thing because 
people who are doing this in the computational field, they know that it's not really easy to do because the more information you give in, the higher the probability that you will interfere with the existing ones. This is called, in a circle, catastrophic interference. This is a curse that all computational neuroscientists know about, that the system works perfectly for a while and all of a sudden it forgets everything. That doesn't sound good for a, a living creature. And it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> no short of uh, removing all your entire neocortex. So the brain has an extraordinary resilience towards such a thing. So what is the other option? There are probably other options, but I can think of one, which is following from my first premise, which is the brain is a self-organized system and is dynamic, doesn't change very much, no matter what you give it to it. Your brain, Albert Einstein's brain and my brain are not fundamentally different, even though both of us agree that he is a little bit smarter than us. <laughs> so in that case, what is the other option? And the other option is that, hmm, actually the brain generates for its own sake, lots and lots and lots and lots of patterns. Not infinite, but very, very, very large number of patterns. Instead of making those patterns, they are already given to the brain researchers for free and to the brain for free. So they are there. What do they do? If we give new things, then we interfere with those things and what will happen? And my message is, or the, my claim is that no. What happens is that it's actually the other way around. The learning is a matching process between a pre-existing pattern and an outside world event that happens to coincide with the presence of that pattern. This is what I call lack of better and more sexy words that matching. And in that case, there is nothing to perturb. What it basically says is that the existing patterns gain some significance, we can call it meaning, for the owner of the brain, which is the organism. This is the most problematic thing that I discuss in several chapters: how we gain meaning. And the only way how you can gain meaning is through action. And action provides that some of those existing patterns actually will become useful for future actions. With a metaphor, which I use, you know, you can think about two dictionaries. One should be Hungarian, the other one should be Chinese. And then you can learn the correspondences between one word and another symbol. And a machine can do it very well. You can do it with some practice also. And you are a perfect relator, but you learn nothing about either of the languages. Now, if one of them is English, then this nonsense dictionary, that is the Hungarian words, can become meaningful if you have the knowledge of the corresponding English words. So here, the knowledge to me is, is action. The brain is full with this nonsense patterns, and through experience, some of them can become meaningful. In my introduction today, I reminded you about this special free trial available at thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash ginger. So now I want to take a moment to tell you why I love this service. The Great Courses Plus is a streaming service that allows you to expand your horizons and to learn from the best teachers in a wide variety of disciplines, including science, humanities, and even hobbies. The Great Courses Plus app allows you to listen or watch wherever you go. This month, I'm re-watching The Science of Gardening. I just watched an episode about mulch, and I really enjoyed the simple experiments that she did to demonstrate why all mulch is not created equal. You can get a free trial of The Great Courses Plus by going to my special URL. Just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com dot com forward slash ginger g i n g e r that's the great courses plus dot com forward slash ginger the brain is full with this nonsense patterns and through experience some of them can become meaningful i actually think that that is a beautiful idea that makes a lot of sense out of a lot of data, which you do a really good job with in the book of, of showing how this idea relates to the data that you actually, that we actually have. 
for example, you talk about in the book how in the animals that you study, the creature has to know not just where it is, but where its head is. So that's making correlations of information to make those nonsensical signals meaningful. That may not be a good example. It's just the one that popped into my head. Another idea that you talk about that is indirectly related and I think really fascinating is the fact that the behavior of the brain is logarithmic. Could you talk a little bit about why why that's significant? If you have linear system, that is everything is uh, changing in a slow way, this is one, two, three, four, five, then it is very difficult to construct a system which means many of the competing requirements what the brain is about. And these are various things. I just can take two extremes. One is that it has to be modified, but it has to be stable. People have learned over the years that when you would like to build a system, uh, an artificial system, that does one thing that it doesn't do this other extreme very well. And in biology, when things are complicated and uh, they have a charge to do many things, the typical answer is diversity of its components. Entire biology is about diversification. There are two ways to do that. One is you can change the components and you add, 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 add. Let's say there are 30 different neuron types in the brain. That's already a lot. You can give a little bit more and there are people who would think there are many more, but not very large. The other thing you can do is change the patterns of the individuals. So let's say, look at the firing rates. And it turns out that firing rates are just like your fingerprints. A single neuron is different from another neuron because it's long time. If you measure the number of action potential it emits over, let's say, 10 minutes or half an hour, an hour, and compare it with another neuron, it's a fingerprint. They are all very different from each other. It's not only different, but in order to be different and you have many, many neurons, on a linear scale, it would be very difficult and it would be difficult to distinguish them, themselves, but it turns out that the rate distribution is in the two, three orders of magnitude different. There are neurons that fire every 100 seconds and there are neurons that can fire every second and sometimes they go up to about 90 per second. So what does this serve? And then you can ask what is the origin of this? And then you look at something else, which is how they are connected. And then you find the same thing that there are connections between neurons that are extremely, extremely efficient compared to the majority. And again, you will find that there are two, three orders of magnitude difference. Then you go to the next level and you say, how many neurons do fire in my brain or you, your brain in one second or in 100 millisecond? And that's a measurable thing. And you can measure it over millions of times and you look at the distributions and you say, huh, most of the time, it's only 0.01% of my neurons fired. But every now and then, I see a 100 millisecond time window when 4% of the brain fired. So we have several orders of magnitude difference how many neurons are being utilized at a time. This is what we call dynamic. Then you can go to the structural level. And then we will find also that if you look at the microscopic connectivity of the brain, you will find that every area of the brain is connected to very few, very strongly. But it's connected to many, many, many areas weakly. And then you can go to the next level, mesoscopic level. I don't give you an example, the microscopic level. And you look at the single neuron and said, hmm, what are the strengths of these synapses? And then you will find that there are synapses, that is the communication channels to the neuron, that are so much stronger than the majority. You look at all of these things, and said, is there a common denominator? And then you plot them, and this, which we did, and you find that they, are, they have a distribution on a log scale that looks like a normal log distribution. Let me explain that. If everybody knows about the bell curve, the bell curve is a bell-shaped curve. It is uh, very simple. You know, if you look at the heights of people, everybody is about pretty much the same, we have a mean, and there are standard deviations. These are the departures from the mean, and then there are people who are smaller, there are people who are larger, but nobody's 10 times taller than any other human being. Nobody's 100 times bigger, nobody 1,000 times bigger than another human being. The largest difference happens among artificial species such as dogs. The biggest variation happens in dog size, but that's because we 
artificially bred them. But in nature, this kind doesn't happen. But in the brain, everything is this skewed. The skewed means that on the right, there are very, very, very few exceptions. So it turns out that the largest pumpkin that people have ever found was in Belgium a couple of years ago. That's about a thousand times bigger than the pumpkins you have in the United States for Halloween. But that's very rare. And then there is a distribution. And people have actually, a long time ago, 100 years ago, started to look at that distribution and said, oh, the fruit size, in, in fact, has this feature. And then uh, they asked, you know, what is in the genes when genetics came around that make it this variability? And they said, well, how do we make variability? Let's go back to the normal distribution and the log distribution. Everybody knows who is learned something about statistics that bell-shaped distribution can be produced by adding or subtracting random numbers. Now, the same applies to the log normal distribution. You just have to multiply and subtract random numbers. So then some of us can go back to the high school days when we had a log ruler. <laughs> yeah, that was a while ago, yeah. Yes, but then you can say, what is the difference between uh, addition and subtractions or additions and, and, and multiplication? Well, on a log scale, Multiplication is addition. That's why we used to do that back when we had um, slide rules. Exactly, exactly. So this is what happens. So the skewed distribution, the simplest skewed distribution is the log scale. Now, there are many different types of, of uh, skewed distributions, such as power laws that I sp spend a lot of time understanding and explaining in my previous book. There is a gamma rule and so on. But the reason why log is so attractive to me is twofold. One is that that's the only one about the skewed distribution that we can explain pretty easily, namely multiplication. The second is that geneticists figured out early on that genes multiply rather than add. And that's the explanation for the big differences in fruit size. And they figured this out early on. The third one, which is so important to me, that when you thought about all of this, that how does it all relate to something useful? And then you go back and say, well, my God, you know, the... There are not too many rules and laws in neuroscience, but there is one which is accepted by everybody. That's the Weber-Fechner law. In brief, Weber-Fechner law is a logarithmic law or rule. Shows that our perception or our sensation or everything we do is changing or we perceive the changes if the change is big enough on a log scale. A typical example that is, is uh, people like to use is that you know, I have in my living room beautiful sun today, in order to notice a, a candle in the corner is very improbable. Or if a flashlight is, is somebody is using it, it won't be noticed. I have to use a proportional change to compare it when the room would be completely dark, because even a, a match would make enough light that I would notice it. So one is about a fraction or proportion. The other one is about the linear scale is about differences. So the brain seems to work and obey fractions because it compares. The brain is a comparator. It always compares something with something else. And this is what we talked about before is that you, know, you have to relate your actions to the perception. You have to have the second opinion. You have to have two things because the brain is fundamentally comparing things. And so with this long story that I, I made a long laundry list about what are the things in the brain that are, have obeyed this log rule, they probably are the fundamental structural and dynamic conditions that give rise to our perceptual log normality. And that applies all, not only to perception, but to our memories, our strength, and many other things that are a consequence of all this. You remember very well what happened in the past two, three seconds, but you are forgetting very, very quickly over time. And that's not a linear forgetfulness, but it's a log or skewed effect. This log behavior of the brain, it just seems to be like something that it is a basic feature. It's the most fundamental thing that I can think of. If you build a, a system, if you build an artificial system and you claim that it's brain inspired, the first thing you have to do is to follow the log rule. Because otherwise, you are constructing the system that has very little to do with the structural and dynamic rules of the brain. 
going to break in here very briefly to ask you to mark your calendars for June 16th, 2020 as the day to buy the new edition of my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. I will explain more in my closing remarks, but the goal is to get as many people as possible to purchase the book on June 16th. We have just been burning through the time, and there's so many things I would like to ask you. One that I am going to do, and then I'm going to get you to pick what you want to do before we close. You know the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. In your book, you talk about a different interpretation of this based on what we now know about how neurons really behave. And I don't know exactly how this connects to what we just talked about, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Well, you pointed it right, you know, that we are talking about plasticity and plasticity according to the rules of wire together, fire together, wire together, at least on the superficial level, is assuming a totally a super flexible brain when anything can happen. And every contributor is pretty much the same. That's so far from the truth because work in my laboratory and work in several other laboratories and there are more and more and more coming out from showing there are certain things that you can hardly ever change. You know, fast firing neurons don't change their firing rates a lot. But strong synapses are very difficult to make stronger. Place fields in the hippocampus are very difficult, which are very, very strong, and they've got a big uh, peak and uh, strong firing. Those don't change no matter what you do with the interference. But the weak ones are changeable, extremely plastic. So indeed, the plasticity is there, but it's not equally distributed to everything or everywhere. And this is a good thing. It's an extremely good thing. The reason why it is a good thing is because many people who are, I don't want to, claim that you know other people are not equally smart and they are not smarter a hundred times than I am. It's just the message that the students take away from these rules is that we can do anything because anything will happen. And, it, and we know it from experience, we know it from psychology, animal behavioral literature that it cannot be right. So it is also not right in the brain either. And when you look at it this way, they said, well, why is it so and what are the advantages? Well, the advantages is this. When you learn something new, how many different aspects of that new thing you have to learn? And the answer is probably a very few. But if you look at it, the plasticity rules, then of course, every single picture is totally different. It's called orthogonal. That is fundamentally different. So you, you put the animal in the different room and the claim is that the hippocampus generate completely new map. I don't know if you follow this literature or, or this is the most important claim about, well, one of the most important claims about the, the brain maps is that when you go in a different environment, you pull out a new map. Now, of course, this is good in a sense, but also very bad because it means that everything is different. But the way I look at it is nothing is new to the brain. Absolutely nothing is new to the brain. That I cannot show you anything in this world any object or any event that you wouldn't say, oh, it is something like. So there is a need also to preserve our existing knowledge and put the new information embedded into the existing knowledge. So when I go to a room, in any room in the world, then I say, oh, this is a room. It doesn't matter. It's not important. And the details become important later when it turns out that uh, I have to find a bathroom or something like that. So from this perspective, it looks like Every single time we learn something, we have to include the pre-existing knowledge. We have to include everything that is giving rise to the added information that the new thing provides us. This is where the plasticity rules are interesting because only certain aspects can change and they have to be incorporated into the existing knowledge. And this is what skewed distribution provides us, that there are neurons that are stubborn, they are not changeable. They are the ones you know, you can call them rich club, <laughs> that they have access to information what the other rich club members do, but also they have access to information for the many other members of the brain. They are saying, oh, I'm in the same room. And the other neurons, they said, no, 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 I'm in a different room. But the one that says the minority, the small minority, I'm in this room, it's the same room, has a stronger say 
because of its stronger connectivity and higher firing rate and so on. This is what I call the non-egalitarian brain because the circuitry and the dynamic biases it that not anything can be imprinted on the brain. There are certain things can be done. There are certain things that are very difficult to do. And there are certain things that may not be possible. And this is known from uh, the behavioral literature. For example, uh, th there are categories called prepared, non-prepared, and unprepared, which means that you can never train a rat to rear, to stand in the high legs, to avoid a shock, because it is so much strongly wired into the brain of, the, of a uh, prey that you don't stand up when you are in danger. This, I think, derives also from the fundamental wiring of the brain and the fundamental dynamic of the brain. There are constraints. And this constraint is beautifully described by this log rule. So I'm thinking of an analogy as you were talking, like as a physician, I've been in a lot of hospitals. And if I go into a hospital, I'm expecting it to be laid out in a certain way, right? And then I have to learn, it's a new hospital, I have to learn where certain things that I expect are, right? So in your experiments, do you see that they're using a pre-existing map and then when they first go into a new place and then they go, like what their place cells do, they fire place cells that they've used in the past? Yes, so the answer to your interesting question a series of experiments were done along these lines. For example, you put an animal, in this case a rodent, into 11 different rooms. And then the neurons that we are recording from are giving you a map that is distinct in each of them. And you look at many neurons and said, yes, 85% of the neurons are telling the experimenter, at least, that the animal is in a different room. But it turns out that 1.2% of the neurons say the same thing in each of the 11 rooms. And then 2.5% of the neurons say the same thing in five of the rooms or six of the rooms. And then you know, it's a minority. So the minority is preserving the information. So when you go to your VA hospital, it said, oh, this is the same hospital I've been before. This is the, the first thing. This is fast and immediate. And then the differences become important only when it makes a difference to your own life. In the outside-in view, compared to the inside-out framework, for a newborn, nothing is new. We say that everything is new to a newborn baby. I think it's the other way around. Nothing is new. Everything is generalized. A face is a face, and it takes several days, weeks, and longer to recognize the mother because the mother is such an important thing. Even though we are wired for the mother's face, the physical features are different, of course, but we have a, a long phylogenetical history for that. So the same applies to everything. There is no need to go from specific to the general. This was already recognized by the Gestalt psychologist. Now, when we see something, we don't put it together from the elements and details. We just say, this is a Jackson Pollock. This is where we have a fast system that is capable of giving you a, what I called good enough answers all the time that helps you quickly and you worry about the details only when it has uh, serious consequences. And this is where we can mobilize much larger part of the brain than uh, what you'd usually do with the immediate reaction. Right. Do you want to expand on that a little? Because I think that that was a really important idea, this, what would be the actual brain implementation of this idea of the fast and slow thinking? So the brain implementation of the fast and slow is that that one is what I call good enough. It requires a small amount of resources, just for the sake of argument, let's say it's 10%. <laughs> <laughs> the infamous 10%. Exactly. And well, this is what comes out from the log distributions also. That is good enough to get by. And uh, it's not very precise, but it's good for very, very, very many things. But if you would like to perform 100%, and you want to make sure that you are driving the highway and you don't have an accident for 30 years, then you have to utilize a lot more of your, your resources. Or if you'd like to make a decision about whether I go to left or right, that's a, a uh, relatively simple decision. But when I have to make a decision about uh, staying home or you know, for a young person, whether I go to college and I got a degree and I will make a lot of money or the other way around, I don't go to college and this way, I'm going to do a lot of money. It's a 
deliberation process that requires a lot more resources than just the decision to make a left turn or the right turn. And so the, the fast decisions are made by this minority of neurons that are there all the time and they fire faster. They are better connected with each other. They are taking part, influencing all the decisions that we make towards a simple solution. The complex solutions require a lot more complicated deliberations and because they require a much larger involvement of the brain hardware and its ingredients, that's why it's slow. Yuri, what else would you like to share before we close? I think that we've given people a taste of the key ideas, but what do you feel like we've left out that's important? My hope is that this book will be read by young people and they ask themselves that, is there anything here that I can use for my own future? I think it's so important is because these days, brain science is steered a little bit towards methods. So when I go around and have discussions with the postdocs and students, and I ask them what they are doing, it is striking how few of them formulate what the problem is they want to solve. And the reason for that is twofold. One is that this is the culture we cultivate at the moment. The second is that, that we pretend that we already have a framework and we know which direction we are heading. And the message of my book is that, no, we don't. In fact, we are, if anything, then we are at a dead end. This is the wrong direction. And I offer something that may not be the right one, but at least it's an alternative. Let's try that. And I think it's a fascinating line of thought. And I'm really, I'm glad I read this book and I'm excited about sharing it with others. I want to thank Yuri Busaki for taking the time to talk with me about his new book, The Brain from the Inside Out. This is a book for those of you who like lots of technical details because it's full of experimental results as well as the fascinating ideas that we touched on today. I can't claim to do justice to the depth of Dr. Busaki's ideas, but I am going to attempt a brief review with a focus on the main ideas rather than the technical details. Recently, more and more evidence has emerged that the brain is not a passive receiver of inputs, but that most of its activity is spontaneous or internally generated. The underlying theme of the brain from the inside out is that we should reevaluate our theories of what the brain does in light of the actual scientific data and possibly abandon assumptions that are based on outdated psychological ideas. It's interesting to note that Dr. Busaki has spent his career studying the hippocampus in rodents, which means he hasn't really been stuck in these old paradigms. He calls his approach the inside-out approach in contrast to the older outside-in approach. Basically, he's saying we should start with the brain rather than our inherited ideas about the mind and various other psychological concepts. I want to focus on the key ideas that stood out for me while acknowledging the challenge of the depth of Busaki's idea. First, there is the contrast between the traditional outside-in approach and his proposed inside-out approach. The old outside-in approach sees the brain as a passive receiver of inputs that then somehow generates outputs. It assumes that the job of the brain is to represent the outside world. It sees the outside world as primary. In contrast, the inside-out approach recognizes the fundamental importance of the brain's spontaneous activity and asks, how does this spontaneous activity relate to the brain's need to control movement as well as its need to predict the results of its own outputs? Another key idea is that the brain is not a blank slate. This is important because computational neuroscientists know that if you start with nothing and gradually build on that, at some point you're going to have catastrophic interference and failure. In contrast, if most of the brain's activity is self-generated, inputs from the outside are less likely to destabilize the system, which makes the brain more robust. <music> 
This brings us to what I see as possibly the most fascinating idea in Busaki's book. He proposes that the brain generates a huge number of patterns that are gradually correlated with experience. This is exactly the opposite of what is usually assumed. He proposes that learning is matching a pre-existing brain pattern with an outside world event. Since the patterns already exist, the system's not perturbed and it is therefore more stable. As I mentioned during the interview, I think this is a really cool idea because he provides so many examples in the book of experimental data that makes sense when one takes this approach. We also talked about the significance of the logarithmic behavior of the brain, including the important point that not all neurons have the same connectivity or influence. Some are highly active, while others rarely fire. This also has implications for plasticity, which is not uniformly distributed. Like Musaki said, the skewed distribution means that some neurons are stubborn in the sense that they are not changeable. Also, he talked about the rich club neurons, which are the ones that have access to many other parts of the brain. This structure makes it possible to learn without destroying what we already know. But it means that there are limits to brain plasticity, and like he said, certain things may not be possible. This inside-out approach leads to Busaki's rather startling claim that nothing is new to the brain. He argues that the brain has already generated numerous patterns, and what the newborn has to do is begin to match these patterns with its experience of the world. He also has an interesting take on the idea of fast versus slow processing. Yuri Busaki's new book, The Brain from the Inside Out, is a challenging and thought-provoking book that will reward anyone who reads it with fascinating new ideas. It also contains a wealth of experimental evidence for those of you who want more detail. As he mentioned during his interview, his book is essentially two books in one because the narrative is supplemented by extensive footnotes. His intention was to make the material accessible to readers with varied backgrounds. If you found yourself disagreeing with something we discussed today, your next step should be to read the book and look up the references, and then feel free to contact him directly. I also recommend that you go to my website at brainsciencepodcast.com for complete show notes and episode transcripts. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or submit voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis. You can also post comments on the Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. Since Busaki's ideas might be regarded as somewhat controversial, I want to close my brief review by giving you a little more context. Early on, I noted the growing evidence that the majority of the brain's activity is spontaneous, rather than a reaction to inputs from the sensory or motor systems. Last month, Matthew Cobb talked about how metaphors influence our understanding of the brain. The spontaneous activity of the brain makes the computer metaphor even more problematic. In an upcoming episode, I hope to talk with George Northoff about his book, The Spontaneous Brain, From the Mind Body to the World Body Problem. We will be discussing the empirical evidence in more detail, as well as looking at how these discoveries could impact our understanding of how the brain generates consciousness. I know this has been a rather long episode, but I need to end with a few brief announcements. First, I want to remind you that the ad-free version of this episode of Brain Science contains five minutes of bonus interview content. For those of you who support the show via Patreon, I want to mention that Patreon now has a mobile app that makes it easy for you to listen to your content on your mobile device, either by streaming or download. Recently, I had a listener who was trying to get their Patreon content via Libsyn, so I want to clarify that the premium subscription, which comes via Lipson, that's the one that gives you access to the back catalog, that is entirely separate from Patreon, which allows you to control your monthly donation. 
If you want more details about the various ways that you can support brain science, please visit brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. I know that some of you may have to cut back your support, but if you're able to continue, please know that it's greatly appreciated. Finally, I want to remind you to mark your calendar for June 16, 2020. That's the day you should be able to buy the new edition of my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. It might actually be available earlier in the month, but the goal is to concentrate the sales on that day so that the book has a chance to qualify as a bestseller in neuroscience on Amazon. However, even though Amazon is the easiest site to promote, you will be able to buy it from any online seller. And if you have a favorite bookstore, they will be able to order the paperback version. Everyone who purchases the book in June will be invited to a special live webinar later this summer. All you have to do is send me an email with a screenshot of your receipt. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to Brain Science for free in your favorite podcasting app, Pandora, or Spotify. And please share the links to this episode with your friends or on social media. I'll be back with another episode of Brain Science on the fourth Friday in June. Until then, please check out my other podcasts, books and ideas, and graying rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Brain Science is copyright 2020 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can share this audio with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mindfire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.